Bugün benim yanımda Bauhaus Imaginista projesinin eş küratörlerinden Grant Watson var. Ee, diğer e, küratör Marion Von Austin burada olamadı. Ee, ancak sizlere e, bir not iletmek istedi. İzninizle e, onun adını e, ben okuyacağım. E, konuşmanın devamında e, Grant bize e, projenin e, genel kapsamını e, aktaracak. E, buradan sonrası dolayısıyla İngilizce olacak. Hoş geldiniz yeniden. Dear public, dear colleagues, dear friends. I have to apologize that I'm not able to attend this opening in person, but it is planned that I join the finish events in April when my health is better. So let me start saying how pleased I am that we were able to collaborate with SALT for the final destination of Bauhaus Imaginista, a project that was realized with diverse partners in 2018 to 2020. Thus, I send many thanks to all participants of the exhibition, Moving Away Istanbul, and to the fantastic installation and organizational team of SALT, especially to Mary Chöner, who is so kind to read this paper for me. Let me begin with the Bauhaus. Established 100 years ago in 1919 in Weimar, as a new model of a design school in the immediate aftermath of the First World War and the German Revolution, The Bauhaus brought together a generation of students and teachers who openly rejected the nationalistic, militaristic, and authoritarian past and insisted on the social relevance of the arts in an emerging democratic society. In contrast to many other reform schools of its time, the Bauhaus was from the outset an internationally oriented school in which several artists of the avant-garde taught, who would never been considered by the nationally oriented art academies or arts and crafts schools in Germany of the time. The radical change of the Weimar art and craft schools program by Walter Gropius was possible because of the political changes of 1918-1919, the November Revolution, the end of the monarchy and the foundation of the Republic. Gropius was as well a leading member of the Arbeistrat der Künste, Soviets of the Art in Berlin, together with Bruno Taut and Lionel Feininger. His teaching program at the Bauhaus Weimar had a strong a national and cosmopolitan orientation, which is reflected in the radical rejection of national or classicist ideas of pre-war art education. It was not Deutsche Kunst, German national art, that was taught at the Bauhaus, but a new vision of the unity of the arts. Thus, Gropius did not adopt the dual model of the art academies and art and crafts schools of the 19th century. His conception was based on apprentice training and the rejection of the division of the disciplines of art and design. Neither Hellenistic casts nor the painting techniques of professors were copied. Instead, with the introduction of the preliminary course and handicraft workshops at the Bauhaus, an ability to design was promoted to find as a student, one's own solutions. Cognitive and manual skills were of equal importance in the experimental handling and learning with often profane materials. Helping to shape this radical imagination for new practices, new forms of learning and new lifestyles was the idea that the individual and the material environment should be freed from all that was unnecessary. Moreover, The Bauhaus was heterogeneous, and its, its three directors, diverse teaching staff at different times, took ideas not only from the arts and crafts movement, communism, Soviet constructivism, and the Neusbauern movement, but as well from spiritualism, theosophy, and anthroposophy. The perpetual reorientation and readjustment of the curriculum in the 14 years of its existence contributed to a wide international perception of the Bauhaus since it created a physical place for the most diverse ideas of modernism in which students coming from various world regions as far as from Japan participated in an experimental manner and took this experience with them to many places worldwide. The Bauhaus graduate Arya Sharon, for example, exiled to Palestine in 1931 and became the major urban planner of the newly built State of Israel but as well as part of the decline of European empires, an architect that responded to local conditions 
when he was designing the post-colonial campus for the University of Ile Ife in West Nigeria. The Bauhaus was a cosmopolitan project from its inception. Bauhauslers forged connections across the globe. In 1933, the school was closed by the National Socialists. As a consequence of the rising power of the Nazis, many Bauhauslers emigrated to countries and world regions beyond Europe. The aim of the large-scale project Bauhaus Imaginista, initiated in the frame of the centenary by the Bauhaus Cooperation and the Goethe Institute, was from the start to provide a rereading of the cosmopolitan condition of the Bauhaus. As curators, we were broadening this perspective to a trans-historic and transnational one, and in relation to contemporary questions, in particular through a series of new artist commissions. Still, Bauhaus Imaginista was not developed just by two Western curators, but through research undertaken with a network of international scholars and institutional partners that are usually not on the map of the Bauhaus canon. The last three years, practice took the advantage to bring new historical research in relation to contemporary concerns. These included, for example, reflections on nationalism and colonialism, the limits of internationalism, and the politici politicization of uh, digital cultures that have been addressed by contemporary artists or scholars in events, symposia, and articles published in the BauhausImaginista.org online journal. One of the central questions that we as curators followed when we started to work together was, how in the course of the 20th century, Bauhaus design concepts and teaching methods were appropriated in diverse localities and societies? And how can we reflect on these diverse readings today? In its conceptual frame, Bauhaus Imaginista thus followed transmission of Bauhaus concepts and practices to different parts of the world. And it followed transmissions by looking at transfers via migration, but also via interpretation, appropriation, and imagination by modernists in other international localities. Through the several research collaborations with scholar, scholars and visual artists from Algeria, Brazil, China, Germany, India, Israel, Japan, Morocco, Netherlands, Nigeria, Russia, Sweden, United Kingdom, and the United States, narratives and histories indicate how Bauhaus teachers and students were in contact with other schools in India, Japan, Russia, and other modernisms internationally, as well as how Bauhaus ideas were adopted or rejected through contact with local conditions and societies, as in Morocco, or how dictatorship in Germany and the USSR have made an end to the avant-garde, or how Cold War struggles, struggles have informed the Bauhaus reception till today or how the non-aligned movement was constitutive for a new design policy in India, etc., etc. Through debates conducted in these localities in Rabat, Hangzhou, New York, Kyoto, Moscow, Sao Paulo, Lagos, and New Delhi in 2018, as well as in Berlin, Bern and Nottingham in 2019, we came to understand more clearly the stakes of each historical case of exchange, its themes and ideas, in relation to a contemporary politics. The question how to reimagine the relationship between the arts and society, how to radicalize art education as part of this question immediately appears when rethinking the Bauhaus and its global resonance, as in each society, the moment of reform and revolution relates to questions of liberation, nation building, or decolonization, and does it till today. Through the dialogical principle as the fundamental basis for new research conducted in the project, it was possible to place the Bauhaus in an international context of like-minded projects, discussing avant-garde art schools as parallel histories of modern educational reform. In this respect, the transfer of ideas, which the Bauhaus participated in, is not told by Bauhaus Imaginista as a story of influence and effect, but of international interdependence. Rather than building on the notion of modernism as having moved from the north to the south or from the west to the rest of the world, the emphasis of Bauhaus Imaginista is on the exchanges and interrelations among international actors and concepts. <laughs> 
a perspective that puts the paradigm of modern nation states in question and in which modernity is not passively received, but is a concept in circulation moving in several different directions at once, subject to constant renegotiation and reinterpretation. Concept of translation, contact, transformation, artistic and cultural mobility open up new horizons of imagination in corresponding multiple modernist movements in which the Bauhaus was an active part and was received in many different ways. This new interpretation of the Bauhaus that drew its impulses from encounters and exchanges with different reform schools and movements worldwide, thus is articulated with the project Bauhaus Imaginista for the first time. Now I leave the rest to Grant to talk to us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marich. And um, so I think in Marion's paper, what she does is she uh, sets out some of the pedagogic ideas of the Bauhaus and then goes on to talk about uh, the process and the questions that we engaged with as curators over the last sort of three and a half, four years. <laughs> And what I'm going to do is now talk <clears throat> a bit more about the kind of curatorial methodology, if you can call it that, um, <clears throat> and also show you some images of, of the projects and the exhibitions that we made. <clears throat> so as you, can, as you can gather from what you've just heard, it's a kind of the brief we were given um, by the Bauhaus and the Goethe and the House of World Cultures was a very broad brief indeed, you know, to look at this international legacy of the Bauhaus between 1933 and essentially the present. And our question, our other question really was, well, how do we do that? You know, how do we marshal all of the potential narratives that could be included in the exhibition project um, into something that becomes kind of coherent and can be communicated to an audience? And the idea that we came up with was to select a series of Bauhaus objects and use them as our starting point. Um, and in German, these are called Gegenstand, Gegenstande. So uh, they're focal objects. And the objects we chose are all uh, ephemeral objects. They're all propositional objects. And what we did was we read these objects in the context of uh, their life at the Bauhaus, but also how could they help us to think of uh, conceptual and thematic chapters and questions which also are prescient today. Um, so the four objects which we selected, one, <clears throat> the first one, unsurprisingly, I suppose, is the Bauhaus Manifesto, um, which is up on the screen. So this is the manifesto written by Gropius in 1919, which was used to, used to promote the school and to attract students to the school. Uh, the second object, oops, sorry. So the second object, I think what I'll do is I'll, because the slides are organized um, by the object and then the project, I'll just go chapter by chapter. So we had four chapters. The first one was called Corresponding With, and the focal object was the manifesto. And the manifesto is a uh, text by Gropius. It's, it describes the ambition of the school. It talks, as Marion has said, about the unity of the arts and the crafts and the construction of the building. And the building, as uh, typified by the finding of woodcut, really is a kind of metaphor for the reconstruction of society after the devastation of the First World War. And on a subsequent page, you get a very detailed analysis of the workshops and the curriculum uh, that will be provided two students coming to the Bauhaus. So it's kind of simultaneously utopic and practical, which I think is actually quite a good definition of the Bauhaus itself. And even though this is maybe one of the most famous uh, pedagogical texts of the 20th century, we, uh, as Marion also said, we didn't want to think of the Bauhaus as the kind of origin of all thinking around pedagogy, but instead we wanted to think about the Bauhaus in relation to a series of projects about education in different parts of the world, and particularly in Asia. So we looked at two schools. We looked at one school which was set up in 1919 by the Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore, and that's the same year as the Bauhaus. And this is important because we're talking here about a school which is really running in parallel. 
That school did have a connection with the Bauhaus. Um, not only did it have a kind of affinity in terms of its project, it was a very influenced by, for example, the British arts and crafts movement. It believed in the, the, the idea of craft production as something which could be really, you know, utilized and instrumentalized to change society, which in the context of India was about decolonization, about kind of building up a, a new culture in opposition to the, the imposition of, of British colonialism. Um, and Tagore was interested in, for example, the, the European avant-garde. He traveled widely and he met an Austrian art historian called Stella Kramrich, who he invited to come and teach in his school. And she knew Itten, Johannes Itten, who was one of the key early Bauhauslers. And she asked Itten if it would be possible to have a exhibition of the Bauhaus in Calcutta. And this exhibition happened in 1922, and it was in fact the first international Bauhaus exhibition which took place in Calcutta, which is, was a little lesser known fact, but is now becoming more widely researched. Um, so in the exhibition, we made a display of um, teaching materials from the Bauhaus. So what you see is mainly um, work from the, the four course, the foundation course, um, and we made a display of objects and materials from Kalabhavan, the school from India, including um, referencing the fact that Tagore not only looked to uh, Indian traditions, he also looked to Pan-Asian traditions. Um, and we also explored the character of the different schools. So the Bauhaus, as you know, <clears throat> had a manifesto. It also had many, many study plans and curricula. It was a very kind of well-organized in that sense. And Tagore's project was much more organic. But there, we, we collected lots of texts about pedagogy um, that we put together into a journal that kind of produced a sort of discourse around the school, um, or reflected the discourse which had been produced around the school. And the second school we looked at was a school uh, called the New School of Design and Architecture. And this is a very interesting project from 1931. And it was set up by a Japanese architect called Renshichiro Kawakita. And Kawakita uh, spoke German, but he didn't travel to the Bauhaus. But he translated texts about the, the Bauhaus into Japanese. And he published these also in a magazine that he produced called I See All between 1931 and 1936. And he met with uh, uh, Takehiko Mitsutani, who was one of the Bauhaus students from Japan. Uh, that had come back from Dessau and worked with him to make a small atelier where they would teach art and design uh, training. Um, and <clears throat> he also worked with several other Japanese Bauhauslers. Um, and when they, when they launched that exhibition, they started with, sorry, the school, they started with an exhibition. And when we were doing our research in Japan, we found these five black and white photographs of an exhibition from 1931 that was made, that was made by Kawakita and Mitsutani. And what was extraordinary about it is how, how many Bauhaus elements it had. It had all these kind of elements from the foundation course. Um, and we thought, this, this is very important material. We really want to show this material. But there was so little. Um, so what we did was we collaborated with a, a, an artist called Luca Frey, and he made this structure, which is called a uh, pedagogic vehicle. And he tried to sort of reconstruct some of the atmosphere of the exhibition and make some of its elements kind of uh, visible for the public. And I think that's an important part, as you'll see in the exhibition, of the way we worked which was to kind of move between archives, uh, design objects, artist projects, um, discursive events, because in a way the complexity of the narrative we were communicating needed all these different layers of interpretation. So the second chapter, which is called Learning From, starts from a small drawing by Paul Clay, and this drawing from 1927, and this drawing um, Paul Clay, very famously in, in um, 1919, 1914, sorry, traveled to Tunis in North Africa. And he wrote in his diary later that this experience of being in North Africa was extraordinarily powerful for him in terms of his work with color. And in this drawing, which is probably of a North African carpet, 
Um, he's exploring abstraction. So he's developing notions of color and abstraction from his interaction with uh, the cultures of North Africa. And what we do in this chapter is we look at the question of cultural appropriation. So we look at how the Bauhauslers in the 1920s were looking um, beyond European mainstream culture to uh, ancient cultures, to non-Western cultures, to the indigenous cultures of the Americas. And we're trying to, in the project, what we try to do is think about this in terms of maybe a contemporary debate about cultural appropriation. So the vocabulary around cultural appropriation wasn't necessarily available to the Bauhauslers, but we thought if we did look at this, this material that we would need to somehow bring that into play. And we start with um, some of the books in the Bauhaus library. So <clears throat> the Bauhaus library has all of these books which are on subjects like uh, Indian uh, temple sculpture, um, the ancient architecture of the Hittites, Andean textiles, and they even have one which is called Cultures of the World, um, material and cultural and art history of all people. So there's this kind of incredibly sort of uh, universalist discourse going on, and this notion of a world art. So a kind of it's it's it's almost kind of like a structuralist notion of particular forms that exist in many cultures. Um, and one of the things about these books, and this is an example, the book on the left is an example of a, a book that was in the Bauhaus Library. The book on the right is, is, is from later. Um, one of the characteristics of these books is that the objects were shown against black or white ground. So while the Bauhauslers and modernists more generally were interested in the kind of aesthetic forms of these objects, they weren't so uh, curious about the social context, for example, and also probably not so interested in the way that these objects had come into European museums, which was often through uh, dubious practices of looting um, and seizure of materials in the context of European colonialism. Um, we look then at the, the weaving workshop and how important Andean textiles were for weavers such as Annie Albers and Gunther Sturzel. And people like Annie Albers and Gunther Sturzel were kind of interested in the motifs of Andean textiles. So the piece you see here is a work from 1927 by Albers, which has a kind of affiliation with these checkerboard designs from uh, Inca tunics. Uh, but they were also interested in the very sophisticated techniques that the, the Inca weavers had developed. So they had developed ways of producing three-dimensional textiles, um, and the Bauhaus weavers actually kind of reproduced some of these techniques. And then further on in the exhibition, we, we discuss the way that uh, when these, many of these weavers emigrate to the United States, they become important teachers of another generation of artists working in textiles, the fiber artists, people like uh, Sheila Hicks and Lynn Ortoni, who were learning ideas about material and structure from their Bauhaus teachers, but also imbibing this interest in pre-Columbian textiles and making these trips to Peru. So for example, um, Sheila Hicks traveled to Chile and Peru in 1958 and collected many materials, which you see the evidence of in her works from that period, which we, we show in the exhibition. Um, there are two, two things that we did as part of this chapter. One was we organized a workshop in New York where we invited uh, Bauhaus scholars and artists, textile specialists and indigenous scholars to come together and convene around a series of uh, groups of materials. So this is us in the Metropolitan Museum. Um, this is Cecilia Vicuna talking to um, one of the curators from the, the, the Annie Arbus Foundation. And we discussed this kind of question of cultural appropriation. Um, and in particular, one thing that came up that was very interesting was the idea of terminology. So the kinds of knowledge production around textiles was using English and French. And it was kind of, in a way, mistranslating many of the concepts from Andean textiles, such as the idea that textiles are a, a living, um, living beings that can produce social relations. So it was a kind of reduction of some of those ideas. And we also showed a film by Kada Atia, um, which 
explored through a series of interviews uh, with curators, with um, scholars and collectors, also this question of uh, uh, restitution. So when do, we, when do you give things back to those communities from which they originally came? So the, the chapter that we are able to show here in, in SALT um, is called Moving Away. Um, and Moving Away begins with this collage by Marcel Breuer from 1926. And this was, this was printed in the first Bauhaus journal. So from 1926 to 1931, the Bauhaus may, had a house journal. And this was used to discuss ideas. So the, the, all the hot debates that were going on at the Bauhaus around kind of functionalism, around style, around organizing life, around kind of, you know, socialism, around ethics. They were kind of being rehearsed in the journal. But the journal was also a space in which the Bauhaus advertised its product. So the Bauhaus was also a business. Um, and it was a business that produced chairs, textile samples, and sold them on the open market all through collaborations with companies. Um, so, you know, Gropius was a kind of very uh, clever entrepreneur and um, was very good at promoting the Bauhaus, also through films. There were several films were made of the Bauhaus, which we showed in another exhibition. Um, and also, ex of course, the exhibitions, the, the famous Bauhaus exhibitions. Um, but the important point about this, this collage is that um, what you see is a, is a film strip. It's a kind of fake film strip, and it shows a series of chairs that were made by Breuer, some in collaboration with Gunther Sturzel, the first two. Um, and you see this kind of rapid style change that happens between 1921 and 1925. So 1921, the Bauhaus is in its expressionist period. And you have this kind of very uh, over-the-top craft object. And then by 1925, you have this chair which is streamlined. It's tubular steel. Um, it's high modernist. And then beyond that, you have a projection into the future where the sitter is on a, a stream of air. And what we thought about this was, first of all, you know, there's no way you can say the Bauhaus had one single style. Clearly, even the Bauhauses themselves were interrupting and critiquing that notion. But secondly, there was a kind of projection into the future. What would ha where would ideas about design go? And that's really the story that Moving Away explores as a chapter very directly. Um, this is an installation shot from the HKV, which shows some of the material. These, this is a, a display which actually is also uh, upstairs, where we have the whole set of the magazines, and you can go up and you can have a look and read them. They're all in German, but there are some English translations. Um, <clears throat> and this is an image of an exhibition that was organized by Hannes Meyer in Moscow. So Hannes Meyer was the second director. He became director in 1928. He was, he was very briefly director. In 1930, he was dismissed by the mayor of Dessau for fermenting political activity amongst the students, or at least that was the criticism. Um, and later that year, in the autumn of that year, he applied to work in the Soviet Union as an architect. So during that period, the Soviet Union was undergoing huge development and industrialization, and architects from all over the world were coming there to, to, to make projects. So he traveled there along with seven of his students who are sometimes known as the uh, Red Brigade or the Bauhaus Brigade. Um, and they sort of like had to try and make their way as jobbing architects in the Soviet Union in shifting circumstances. So there came a point um, at which ideas about international model modernism fell out of favor. And then some of the students, some of the then architects uh, found themselves interned, uh, enemies of the state. Um, some of them then traveled back to the GDR. Some of them were stuck in the Soviet Union. It's, some of them moved, worked in Iran. Some of them worked in North Korea. It's a very interesting, it produces a very interesting map of that period, the Cold War period, the connections between different socialist countries, and how the architects were kind of moving between those things. Um, and what we found in the Bauhaus archive in Berlin were these really extraordinary um, 
collections that these, some of these architects put together, some of these Bauhaus architects put together. And these collections, there's a slideshow in the exhibition, which is a slideshow of one of these collections. And these collections include photographs from the Bauhaus, they include arrival in the Soviet Union, they include diagrams of the, the, the places that they lived, they, they include the projects that they were involved in. And then they start to include almost like a kind of mail art activity where they send each other information about each other's projects. And as curators, we found these archives fantastically interesting, but we knew that they were too dry to uh, just put in an exhibition unmediated. So we worked with, um, oh, this is actually an image from the archive of Philip Tolzener, and this is, this is the man himself. Um, so we worked with a series of artists to develop projects around these archives. So two are in this exhibition, one by um, Alice Kreischer and one by Doreen Mende. This is a film by Wendelin von Oldenburg, which is about uh, one of the women architects at the Bauhaus. She was the first woman to enter the building program in 1927, I think, um, when Maya came to run that program. And it's, she's called Lotta Stambeza. And what's interesting about the film as you'll see when you watch the film, is that she visits the play, she visits the projects that Lotta Stambeza made, one in the Ukraine and one in Rotterdam. Um, and she interviews the people that currently live in those buildings. So there's a sort of a, a, a kind of play on um, the current inhabitation of, of modernist architecture. Um, how did those ideas, which were embedded in that architecture, around facilitating a better way of life? How did they stand up um, in the course of time? And, you know, obviously what Wendelin von Oldenburg comes up with is a nuanced take on, on that question. Finally, in this chapter, we look at a school from India. I've spoken about it several times today. <laughs> so it's, it's called NID, and it was established in 1961, and it was really part of a kind of uh, post-independence impetus uh, by the Nehru government to put design on the map, to use design as a development tool. And it, was, it had a strong connection to Haifgate Ulm. So Haifgate Ulm was a school that was established in 1953 in, in, in post-war Germany. Um, it was originally intended to be called the new Bauhaus or the Bauhaus, I'm not sure which. This idea was rejected, but they did uh, have Max Bill uh, as their first rector, and they employed um, uh, Joseph Albers and uh, Walter Peter Hans, and several Bauhauses came and they taught, in particularly the foundation course. Um, and then when the school in India uh, opened in 1961, they started to communicate with the school in Germany, and there were students that studied in, in, in, in Ulm and came back to India. And you had this kind of transfer of Bauhaus ideas via Ulm, um, and very interesting um, kind of uh, sort of mediation of these ideas. So you had the, um, the reality of the Indian consumer as such, you know, which was something like 90% people living in rural situation, whereas, of course, in West Germany in the 1950s, very industrialized, very urban. And so you had the need to uh, adjust Bauhaus ideas really quite strongly to a new context. Um, and these are some of the projects which you can see are using uh, materials like bamboo and cardi cloth, um, things that could uh, maybe cheaply made or can be made in, in a village context. Um, and then you had the foundation course. So you had the foundation course, which, which I think Marion said in her paper was the kind of the sort of rock bed of the Bauhaus pedagogy, the one year open-ended teaching. Um, and that was translated into uh, NID. And our researcher, Suchitra Balasubramaniam, who um, worked with us on the research for this, she said that when she went to the Bauhaus archive in Berlin, she was amazed when she saw the exercises that were there that the students had done in the 1920s because they were so similar to the ones that she had done when she was studying at NID in the 1980s. But then she said that what, but what also happened was a kind of big move in the 1970s to, to really kind of reform the curriculum um, and to start to go out into villages and to start to kind of 
work with the knowledge that existed in that context rather than just kind of adopt these ideas from, from West, you know, post-war West Germany. Um, the final chapter is called Still Undead. And this chapter departs from a work by Kurt Schwertfeger from 1922, so it's quite early on. And it was an apparatus that was constructed for a party. So um, right from the very beginning, Gropi said that there would be social events, parties. This would be a very important part of the school's life. And it would help to forge a community and you know, a kind of affinity between uh, students and masters. Um, and, but of course, because it was the Bauhaus, they put a huge amount of effort into developing their parties, music, costumes. And this uh, apparatus was made for uh, the Lantern Party in 1922, and it was shown in the apartment of Vasily Kandinsky. And it's essentially a box, um, and it has a kind of sections with uh, holes cut out, and it has colored lights. And if you move, performers move these, you get this kind of color projections. And what we were interested in, really, to start with in this chapter was to think about the idea of a surplus. So what is there? What is that kind of creative energy that's being developed at the Bauhaus beyond, above and beyond the functionalism which it's famous for? And of course, the parties typify that. Um, and we looked at uh, the work, for example, of um, Mohali Naj, who took this idea of color light experimentation with his much more famous piece, which is called uh, light prop for the electric stage. And we looked at the kind of afterlife of some of these projects. And we also looked a bit at the party context as a space at the Bauhaus for actually experimenting with notions of gender and subjectivity, even though perhaps they wouldn't have used those terms at the time. So on the right, you see quite a famous slideshow of images by Gertrude Arndt, where she enters into this performance and kind of masquerade of different notions of femininity. Or uh, the photographs from the parties of Lux Feiniger, which have this kind of very transgressive uh, kind of gender queering, what we might call gender queering um, feeling now. Um, and then we looked at the sort of commercialization of some of these ideas, particularly in the, night, in the United States. So Mohali Naj traveled in 1937 to Chicago and became the director of the new Bauhaus in Chicago. Um, and there he set up this light and color workshop with Georgi Kepesh. And many of these ideas found a, com a commercial reception in the kind of new sort of like um, creative industries of the United States in the 1950s and 1960s. Kepesh went on to MIT, for example, and became a very important figure there. And we also look at the British Bauhaus. Um, so uh, Mohali Naj was briefly in London between 1935 and 1937. And this image here is of a window displays that Mohali Naj made um, while he was in London. Um, in which some of these ideas about light, about staging, about theater, are kind of utilized for um, the, the, the, the, the sort of selling of products, essentially. Um, so those are the four chapters. And what you, see, what you see here at SALT is moving away. But if you want to get a much more detailed um, sense of the exhibition, the place I would send you to is the online journal. So we have an online journal, and it's Bauhaus-Imaginista.org. And that journal, it's a kind of very uh, deep archive with lots of material about both the 2018 projects and discursive events. There's lots of material that's been filmed. We have many texts. Um, and we have many images from the, the different projects we did in different parts of the world. And that. Uh, the online journal is presented in the foyer area. So when you came in, you passed a series of boxes with different materials on. And that's a project called uh, Bauhaus and Medianista Collected Research that we made in collaboration also with Luca Frey. Um, and it's a p his piece is called Bauhaus Jukebox. And the idea is that you can kind of, you can explore and play and look through the different chapters uh, of the project. Um, so I'm, that's me done. I just want to say thank you to Merich and her team and to 
the Goethe Institute in Istanbul for helping to bring collected research here. Um, and this is, in fact, the last leg of Bauhaus Imaginista. So thank you. So if people have questions, I'm happy to answer. It, it does now. It does now. Oh, okay. <laughs> what are you doing the research? No, it, it, well, no. I mean, the thing. The this so how is. How do you select those countries? Yeah. How do we? Well, I think. The the, we select them really um, through our um, Gegenstande and our concept. So um, we had we had these four chapters, and so one chapter was pedagogy. Uh, so then we looked at schools. And we looked at these three case studies. I mean, we could have looked at other schools, it's true. And in each chapter, in each instance, there's always another example that could have also been there. Um, in, the, in the chapter, Learning From, we looked at cultural appropriation. So we looked at these practices mostly from uh, the United States, uh, but also from North Africa. Um, and then, you know, in our research, we didn't. There are so many examples like Turkey that we weren't able to to really fully explore. Um, but for example, when we went to China, we did we did some research in China. But then the China Design Museum took that much further. They made many interviews about Bauhaus uh, reception in China. And when we came here to Salt, uh, Merich and her team, um, and I guess very early on thought it would be really important to anchor the project in a discussion around design teaching. And I think one of the things that came up um, through that research was the importance of basic design and the kind of foundation course as something which is, this is a whole nother project actually, because the one, one thing that came out of our research was how uh, influential that basic design idea has been in Turkey, in Brazil, in the United Kingdom, in India, you know, in Japan. Um, so I, I, th I think what we tried to do is we tried to, on the one hand, we went conceptually with our chapters. And secondly, we also had a feeling that we wanted to bring the project to particular places. So we wanted to go to Brazil. And then we, we, we found a way to kind of um, think our concept through in that, in that setting. India, could you tell the name of the school again, please? It, and what's the relation with that school and NID later? The, the school itself is called Kalabavan. And um, the relationship with, the, with NID, there is a relationship. And it comes through one particular figure called K.G. Subramanian, who uh, was trained at Kalabavan and was an important teacher um, in, also in Kalabava. And then he moved to Gujarat and became a teacher in Baroda. But he was also on the board of, of NID. He was one of the kind of advisory council of NID. And so some of the ideas, because also, as I said, when I talked about the Indian school, there was a strong emphasis on craft. And they had a, a, a place, uh, Institute for Rural Reconstruction, called Sriniketan. So ideas about craft, about rural reconstruction, about working with villages. This was also part of the Shantinikate and Kalabavan culture. And I think that continued in NID. But in NID, there was a, obviously a much stronger emphasis on industry and modernity um, and technology. So I think the earlier school had been much more embedded in craft, in music, in poetry. It was a, actually a kind of more romantic project. And the post-independence project, I think, was a more, it was more about kind of modernization and modernity in, in, in a more internationalist style, I think. 